All right, so <laughs> what we're talking about is, uh, what I'm going to talk about is how to work with remote freelancing uh, developers abroad. Um, I work at uh, an agency called Decode. It's the largest WordPress specialist agency in the Nordics. It's called, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I totally, it's not, it's called Decode. <laughs> Well, uh, we're not only the largest uh, agency in, in the Nordics, we are also a WordPress.com VIP agency, uh, which we share with uh, 10 other agencies worldwide. And we are a gold uh, Woo expert agency, which we share with uh, three other agencies in the Nordics or Scandinavia, uh, all of which are presented here uh, today. So if you want to, to talk to a Woo expert, there are uh, Nils Fredrik over there, and Jimmy, who presented here earlier, and uh, it's me. Uh, the cool thing is that worldwide there are two agencies in total who have both these credentials. So uh, as a cause of this, or it's kind of a chicken and egg uh, situation, but uh, our clients demand the very highest uh, quality standards from us. Uh, and also we have constantly a full pipeline. Currently, or for the last six months or so, our pipeline has been full for three or four months. And as a, a business owner uh, told me dur during lunch, this is a crisis. And it kind of would be, uh, because we need extra hands from time to time, all the time, uh, but we can fix that. Uh, in general, uh, there are some advantages by using freelancers. Uh, Sweden, like Norway and most other uh, Western countries, are pretty um, high-cost countries. So price is, of course, uh, a good factor, but it might not be the, the most important one. Another one could be competence, that you actually need uh, a certain skill set that is difficult to find locally where you are, uh, where your headquarter is. And if you're like us, you might need the flexibility. From time to time, you need extra hands to work on, work on projects. But this does not come without communication difficulties. Um, there are actually uh, a lot of them. Um, one thing is that people are working from remote. Uh, there are probably someone here who knows more about communication than, than what I do, but I think it's, it's roughly like 80% of what we communicate is through body language, which is totally lost when you're working with someone remote. Also, you don't know each other. A person that you know well, you communicate so much better with, you know what they mean. Uh, when, when they say something, you know what they mean, and you don't have to make them elaborate on, on anything. And also, uh, there's, there can be a huge a culture barrier. Even with, uh, with uh, native English speakers, you have uh, certain idioms, certain culture dif uh, differences uh, between Australians and Americans, for instance. So they sometimes even get, get things confused. So the most important skill that you need from a remote worker is communication skills. I would choose um, a mediocre developer with good communication skills any day over a developer who's excellent at programming but can't communicate because that person is basically useless. So the first thing you need to do is to establish a common un understanding. And the first one is, of course, scope. What is supposed to be done? And I, I can imagine most people here have uh, experienced scope creep when your client wants you to do more and more and more. So establish basic tasks that need to be, be done and be very, very specific about it. Then you need to discuss quality. We have worked with, uh, with freelancers. Um, well, freelancers are often hired because they're cheap. So people or agencies, companies, want them to work fast. You can't have fast, cheap, and good quality. You need to pick two. 
So if you have higher quality standards than, than usual, communicate that quickly. And then, of course, finances. This can be very difficult when you do transactions um, with people you don't know over country lines, over borders. You don't want a developer who doesn't know if they're getting paid, how they're getting paid. Uh, this takes focus off from the development that you need them to do. So make sure that you remove all obstacles. This is the first task that you need to do when you establish a relationship with a new developer. And the first thing that you need to get rid of is finances. Well, not don't get rid of the finances, but as an obstacle. Make sure everybody knows uh, when payment will happen, how payment will happen, and so, so, so developers know knows that this is out of the way. Then become informal, because people you know you communicate better with. So the the uh, the quicker that you become informal, the quicker you can communicate on a uh, easier level. So the first thing <laughs> is to communicate. You need to establish communication, communication level with, with the developers. And your project manager will be extremely important here. The, the Norwegian and also the Swedish term for, for project manager translates into um, project leader, which can be quite misleading. The most important role of your project manager is to be a project secretary. They need to make sure that everybody has what they need, when they need it, that they don't uh, have any confusions about anything, that everything is clear, documented, and on time. So a better term might be project superhero. As a project manager, you need to make sure that you are the superhero of your developers. Make them look at you as, as a superhero, as superpowers that can get them all these things on time when they need it you will be the key to the project's success. You are not the boss of the project. Never, ever imagine that, that, that you are the boss. You may, may be the leader, you are the manager, but you are nothing without your developers. Be humble about it. Without your developers, you're nothing but paperwork and a smile. What you can do is uh, treat your developers as plants. Give them whatever they need, sunshine, air, water, nutrition, and they will grow, and they will be nice. There will be extra management when you're working with remote freelancer developers abroad. There's uh, no way around it. Uh, the first thing you need to do is defining scope. And defining the scope takes more time than within a fully internal project. Your task descriptions may need to be much more detailed so they know exactly what they need to do. But also make sure that you gather valuable feedback from your experts. You hire them because they're good at something. Make sure that they provide the feedback back to you. Because uh, your descriptions may not always make sense. They might have better ideas to make the project better. So you seriously need to communicate. I cannot stress this enough. You need to build a bridge. Across this bridge is where all the communication happens. It's, it's how you work with your, with your developer. Start with da daily stand-ups. Maybe for the first week, maybe for the second week, as long as you need them. Every day, you start a day with uh, talking to your uh, developers and checking that they have everything they need. They are performing as they're supposed to, and that there are no uh, confusions or, or anything. As often as you need to, use Slack all the time. Well, use Slack all the time. Then use uh, something like Skype or whatever uh, to discuss more things in detail, because it's easier when you can talk to each other and you can see the body language and things like that. But whenever you come to a conclusion about something, document it. Whether it's in GitHub issues or Jira or Asana or whatever, uh, uh, project management uh, tool that you're using, make sure it's documented. Never leave a decision in the open because in two weeks, nobody knows what was uh, decided upon. Uh, 
I have a project manager uh, that says, if I'm an idiot, tell me. And he also says, um, the sooner in a project someone tells me I'm an idiot, the better the project will go. Because then you have established an informal channel of communication that everybody is uh, comfortable with. You need an onboarding process so that the new developers know how everything is supposed to work. We often, um, we always assign a buddy. This buddy is an experienced developer that has worked uh, at the company for a long time, so he knows uh, all the processes, uh, knows how everything works. And for uh, at least the first week, uh, this buddy needs to be assigned roughly 50% on the project, so the buddy is always available. The primary primary function of the body is to give guidance to the new developer, but it's also to do a code review and make sure uh, everything is as it's supposed to be. Uh, often we, uh, we assign two buddies, so, so they have um, more players to play with. Then, a warning. If you don't have your internal processes in order before you get something external on board, everything will crash and burn. There's no way in hell you're going to manage uh, to have, have a successful uh, project if you don't have your internal processes in order. This is not the right time to, to make them up. So, would you find a freelancer? What? You could probably find one here. How many here have uh, worked as a freelancer or is currently working as a freelancer? There. That's a lot of you. Social media. And you can use a freelancer agency. We do that. Sounds contradictable, but I'll let you know. So here's a story about regular hiring. Um, I have a friend who runs an, an agency. There are maybe 50% are remote. He has reviewed, this is more than two years ago, he had reviewed more than 1,000 candidates. That's a lot of people. Well, he found a good uh, remote developer from a low-cost country where um, they don't have good internet access, but they do have internet access. So they couldn't do much video conferencing, but he was available on, on, on Slack all the time, or HipChat is what they used. After two weeks, suddenly, his language and the quality dropped. So they, uh, they took a little powwow, talked together, and the quality and language went back up again. It was good for a week. Then it uh, declined again. Uh, what we think happened is that they were a team that had one good developer who were hired at a lot of companies and was putting the other developers who were shitty on the job after he got, got into the, the company. So regular hiring is extremely time consuming and risky. What we use is a freelancer agency. They're like a candy shop to us. We can just go in there, and everybody's pre-qualified. They only have good developers. We know that they know how to work. And this freelancer agency, they help us find the right developer. We, need, we tell them what skill set we need, and uh, what kind of person we need, and they'll find it for us. So I think we constantly have maybe two or three people from, uh, from that uh, agency. And also, they take care of the finances. We always prepay one week of uh, work uh, to the agency. So the money is in escrow, and the developer knows that when the uh, week is done and we give the thumbs up on the, on the work that they've done, they get paid. No fuss. Always think long term. Even if it's a one-off job, you might need another one-off job down the road. So build a relationship. Make sure that this developer is familiar with you. Invest your time into the developer so they grow like a plant. But if uh, a 
red flag arises, you feel that, oh, something is off here. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is enough. We need someone else. As early as possible, always. So, if you think you're ready to, to hire external people, make sure that you realize that communication is key. Communication is absolute key. Nurse your newcomer. Make sure that they feel they have room to grow. Make sure that they feel appreciated. And make sure that you are ready, that all, all things internal is clear for, for a, a newcomer that's from the outside. If you want to discuss or contact me later, I'm available on Twitter. I work at Decode, and yes, we are hiring. We need a lot of people right now. Thank you. Questions? Is that what we're asking for now? Um, yes, we have time for questions. Um, do we have any in the audience? There's one on top there, I think. Yeah, it's a bit hard to see. Um, so at the very top. Um, I can have one in the meantime. Yeah, uh, sure. What would you say was the biggest uh, uh, problem when you started working with freelance developers? Or what was the major thing that you were putting your time into to mm -hmm. fix, so to say? We have kind of always worked with freelancers. Um, the first ones that came on board were practically employees. Um, later, uh, we got, we tried some freelancers from um, different countries, and um, it crashed and burned. Uh, it didn't go well. We didn't have uh, the internal policies in place. Uh, we weren't ready. Um, our internal language at the time was Norwegian, and so we had to translate everything. Now it's in English. Uh, now we have a, a huge remote team, so, uh, so we're used to having uh, people remote. That makes it much, much easier. Yeah. Is that a question? Can you hear me? Yeah. Here. It's Jacob from Triggerfish. So I have two questions. Uh, one is, do you have any opinions on what kind of countries are working better or worse? Uh, and the second question is, um, uh, do you, how do you handle long-term maintenance of these projects? Uh, do you keep on relationship with the, with the external one, or do you bring them back home and, and try to, this is our solution now and so forth? Yeah, um, first in terms of countries, it's not so much about countries, but more about time zones. We do time zones plus minus one. So we, do, uh, we have freelancers from Britain and we have freelancers from uh, Romania. Um, I have personal opinions, I'm sure. Um, no, uh, that, that, that's the important thing. We also have uh, one who's re working remote from, from DC, so we could uh, potentially, a senior developer, so we could potentially work with someone from, from, uh, from the East Coast in, in the United States, but we haven't done that yet. But, uh, but the time zone is quite important. Uh, the other question, what was it? So how do you handle long-term maintenance of these projects? Oh, um, well, our onboarding process is pretty good. Uh, so we know uh, what will be developed. Uh, we know everything about the tasks. Uh, we, we, we put them on board as if they were internal. So. Um, so we have a pretty good, good view of what's going on. And also, uh, because of the buddy system, we know uh, what is actually being done. And nothing, um, nothing goes into production without code review. Uh, nothing goes without uh, testing. So, so we know what is, uh, what is developed. So we could basically put any, any other developer on the project uh, for the long-term run. The, the project manager is, is kind of key, but he could also be, uh, be switched out. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, one hand, two rows below, so you can just pass the mic. Okay. I would be interested to know uh, a little bit about like what rates you pay developers abroad and also what rates that you pay developers that are in more high-cost countries, for example, the States or, or the Nordics. Or like what's um, what's a rimlig um, expectation there? 
Well, f first of all, uh, our motivation for getting freelancers is not cost. It's that we need, uh, need extra hands, and we make sure, make sure that we bill our clients uh, accordingly. Um, to be honest, I don't know. It's, uh, finances is not, is not my, my game. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yep. um, one more question from me. Um, what would you say, or I lost it a bit, but um, comparing to companies like Automatic, for example, they have all people working remote. Uh, would you say that it's a good thing to do like they do and gather people together once in a while? Or do you do something like that? Or does it work out with only communicating online by video or Slack, for example? Um, yeah, we do something like that. We, we like to bring, uh, well, we are a remote team. Uh, maybe one third of us works remote. Uh, we have had people in Italy, in, um, in, uh, in England, and now in DC, uh, in some rural areas of, of Norway. Uh, I'm one of them. Uh, so we bring people together as often as possible, and uh, even if it's uh, just one or two of them, we, we, we bring them and fly them into to the headquarters in Oslo. Um, but also we have gatherings, maybe two or three times times a year. We we, we gather and we work on, work on projects, work on internal issues, uh, things like that. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I think it's very important. Uh, companies like like Automatic is full distributed, so so it's kind of uh, easier because they have all the internal processes. Uh, in order to work with people remote. If you are uh, mainly a, a concentrated, uh, you have a headquarter and, and that, that's it, everybody's working together there. You don't have the processes in order to, to hire one remote or two remote people. They will feel like they're on outside because you know there will be a lot of communications going on uh, internally that they are not part of. So, so we had to, uh, during the past two years, uh, twist our company a little bit because we are still we still have a headquarter but we st now have two major uh, remote offices in another location and, and a lot more remote people so we are better at communicating all across yeah. the company anyway um, and a follow-up question on that which sort of was spoken about but how do you do you have any good tips on how people can make sure that different offices or remote people don't feel excluded from the small talk that's going on in the office? Is there any good way or is it just the well, way it is? Well, yeah, um, we, use, we use Slack a lot. Uh, we make sure we have a water cooler channel where anything goes, whatever it is. You can mute that if you want to uh, for certain periods. Uh, we make sure that all meetings are on uh, the terms of those who are working remotely and uh, joining in via via video, so so uh, you feel really welcome. But of course, there will be uh, talk in in the office that you are not part of. So uh, you can you can you can try to talk with the other remotes then. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more? So, yeah, one question up here uh, on the very front. So it's far up. Hello. Hi. Um, I noticed when you spoke about the buddy deal that you, you refer to the buddy as he. And I was just curious uh, what type of a gender ratio you have on a remote team and how do you feel about that? I'm terribly sorry. I heard it myself when I said it. And I regret regretted it immediately because one of our best uh, internal uh, developers uh, one of our best senior developers, who is best at being a buddy, is female. Uh, it's because English is my second language. Sorry. <laughs> Do we have any last question? Yep. At the very top. So we'll just have a mic. I think we can see a pretty obvious trend that uh, more and more developers are talking about uh, freelancing as opposed to being hired full time. Uh, and, it, and it seems it's uh, increasingly becoming the preferred way of, of being hired. Is that something you're planning for within the company? And if so, how are you doing that to, to still be able to uh, call? Like, yeah, I think you understand the question. <laughs> yeah. Um 
Mm, it can be. Some of the people we have hired, we, we hired as freelancers first. Uh, some of them had worked uh, 10 years as, uh, as freelancers, but when they saw uh, how it would uh, gain them to be part of a, a larger uh, development uh, agency, they, they wanted to, uh, to be hired full time. Uh, we are using uh, freelancers mainly as um, when we need extra extra hands or when we need uh, someone who has a skill set that we don't have ourselves. We will continue to hire people primarily uh, as full-time employees. Yep. So, we are running out of time. Bjorn will most certainly be here afterwards. You can always catch him up for questions. Sure. Will we see you on the after party? Yes, of course. So it's a perfect time. <laughs> if you have questions, buy him a beer and he'll probably answer them. We hope so. So, a big applause and thank you, Bjorn. Thank you.